views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Demartini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. It is so great to be connecting with all of you. I'm Dr. Pat. Yeah, I love, love, love all of the different things that we come and share with all of you. I am like super excited about today's show. But first, let me say hi to Mr. Benny. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hi, Pat. How you doing? Be good. I be good. I know you be good. You know, I, did you ever grow up like um, with... Uh, looking under your bed for like things, or did monsters you monsters all the time? Yes, monsters. Ah! Or <laughs> were you Sorry. the kind of kid that was like, "What's in my closet"? Uh, no, but I and... found my telescope I always wanted in uh, Christmas in like '88, so that was always a good thing. Oh my gosh! <laughs> did you? <laughs> I just added my parents right there. Did just like all <laughs> oh, right there. Did, so did you ever like? talk to imaginary um let's just say entities i wouldn't necessarily say entities i just talk to myself all the time <laughs> so other people probably think that i do that in the elevator now and i'm 40 so it makes uh, sense you know i gotta tell you i'm uh-huh. so excited about today's show talking Ooh. with the varla right here because mm-hmm. i was one of those kids ah. where i had what you know with the psychiatrist called if you really want to know my imaginary friends but after reading after reading varla's book i am like not sure how imaginary any of this was um and today we get to talk with for those of you that are wondering who i'm talking about varla ventura is joining me here today we get to talk with her about her book fairies pukas and changelings this is a complete guide to the wild and wicked enchanted realm i love that benny don't you love that super love super love I know it. And I love the whole enchanted realm thing because I think I've got an enchanted realm sitting on my shoulders right here. It's called my mind. Uh, Varla is the author of Banshees, Werewolves, Vampires, and Other Creatures of the Night among, uh, among, uh, uh, Among the Mermaids and this book right here, Fairies, Pukas, and Changelings. And so you have to know, right? You kind of have to know that she has connected. And what do I mean by connected? You know, whether you've read her books or you visited her website or you've had a personal conversation with her, here's the thing. This is about tapping in to what we may think is going on, or even if we don't think it's going on, to tap into something that sometimes you can't explain. Viola, it's great to have you here. Thank you. What a beautiful introduction. um, I'm so happy to be here. And um, I love your, uh, the story of you talking to quote unquote imaginary creatures (laughs) <laughs> and um, and I agree. I mean, the the most enchanted realm any of us have is probably right on our are on our own two sho- shoulders. So um, I think it's very interesting to think of fairy tales and creatures in that in that light as something that we need to sort of explore and explore that that creativity and that belief, whether mm-hmm. we actually believe it and have actually had encounters 
or we just love a good story. I think something very positive happens in our own minds when we start to acknowledge the realm of impossibility as possible. Yeah. You know, I have to talk with you a little bit because, you know, I, I, I get to, I get to chat with many, many people. As a matter of fact, I think, I think Jessica and Linda counted now about 8,000 people over a 14 year period. And I'm always fascinated, even to this day, how in awe I am when I receive a book like you've written. And I'm thinking to myself, why now? Why did Varla, how did she, how did Varla, how did she write this book? And why is this coming to the surface now? I don't think there's any mistakes. Do you? Oh, I, that's, you know, the, the sort of path that I've been on went from sort of bizarre stories and trivia. I got into the mermaids and the banshees and during the process, especially of writing the book about banshees, werewolves, and vampires, the banshees are a creature that are much more um, identified with the fairy kingdom. And so I discovered several old collections that I was not familiar with. And that, you know, that's just a rabbit hole because now you're into all of these other creatures, some of which I had never heard of. And as an avid fairy tale reader and magical creature person all of my life, there were some things that I, you know, had never even heard of, especially in like some of the Welsh folklore. So um, it felt, you know, just sort of like a natural progression into this, into this realm. Um, and it's such a huge category. I think we, we think of fairies and, you know, our automatic image as, you know, like a, a flower fairy or something with wings that's pretty and it's flitting about. And I found, you know, as a child, I remember my mother reading me some very frightening fairy tales. I mean, they weren't meant to terrorize anyone, but they were definitely much darker than mm -hmm. what we think of today. And I think I was always sort of fascinated with those kind of like the Bob yeah. creatures and those sorts of things. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. I love that you said that because you're right. I grew up. Uh, in, in an era and generation where, you know, we kind of now have glorified, if I should say, on the big screen, many, many, many of the really dark, scary things that I kind of grew up with. Um, and I really, I, I, I remember growing up and I was so addicted, if I could use that term, to all of the creepy movies, all of the werewolf movies, all of the the, the vampire movies, all of the dark movies. You, I mean, all of the comic books that were out there about superheroes. I mean, I was so, that was part of my life um, to the point where I literally cr surrounded myself with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, fast forward to where we are today. Have we, through Hollywood, if I could say, have we demystified them to a point? Well, that's an interesting question. Because yeah. I think that we don't necessarily, I mean, the things that are scariest are often the things that are most real to us. So in some ways, the you know, some of the stories of like maybe a puka or... Mm -hmm a changeling or something like that, it coming kind of more into modern terms, mm -hmm. then we have um, the, you know, sort of the terror and the wonder that comes along with it is more relevant to today's audience because they, you know, it's, it's put in like a, a modern context. You can think about horror stories in the same way. Now you can read an Edgar Allan Poe and you will always be tormented by the sound <laughs> of the heart in the floorboards. <laughs> You're probably going to be a little more freaked out if you read a horror story about, you know, um, you know, someone tapping, you know, some sort of entity in your cell phone or something that's going to be in your pocket <laughs> every day. So there's an element to both, um, you know, to fantasy and also to fairy tales and fairy creatures that does kind of have to adapt to the modern world in a certain way. Um, but I think you find with the sort of the old lore about um, the fairies that you'll find that it is a much more terrifying world than you ever cared to imagine. And that so many of those sort of creatures, including like swamp creatures, those 
that we think of today as like, you know, fictional movie characters, those have evolved from the old stories. Yeah, and I love it. You know, my grandma used to say something like, uh, this is the way I, this is the way I would say it now, that what you can conceive, you can achieve. And she would also say, what is already achieved, someone has conceived. And I used to say to her, you know, mama, what, you know, what about ghosts? What about goblins? What about fairies? What about this? What about that? And she would just smile, you know, with that beautiful Italian face and say, Hmm. Those two. And I I grew up thinking that they were fairy tales, but kind of maybe not. Is that a is that a modern day sort of bridge that's being <laughs> that's being made where where people literally are looking at some of these tales and seeing modern day versions of it in real life? Well, you know, I'm a little, probably a little uh, old fashioned and <laughs> a little older than, you know, what maybe modern kids are looking at these days. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that I could ask my nieces to fill me in on the latest video game <laughs> that, you know, include these kind of creatures. But um, at the same time, I find that maybe that line between <laughs> fantasy and reality is not quite as clear and so in some ways, like that can be vulnerable for kids, especially, but it also can open up the possibility that, you know, these things are real or maybe there is something around mm -hmm. the corner or tapping, tapping at your window. So I find it important to be able to suspend the idea of believing or not believing long enough to try and absorb whatever lesson there is, and, and with so many of these folk tales, they, they definitely serve dual purpose. They, they're cautionary tales, and that's sort of the fairy tale in general is the greater. Yeah. These are all sort of fables and cautionary tales to keep you from wandering too far from the fire. But at the same time, um, it's a reminder that, you know, there, you really don't know everything that's out there. And there is this sort of open gate. And you see this with the paranormal a lot. You have a yeah. lot, of, um, an amazing amount of skeptics in the paranormal community who spend, you know, a lot of time, um, with more kind of on the more scientific end of things. And I completely appreciate that. And I find that, you know, it, it does depend on your own personal experience. Perhaps you finally have a paranormal experience, but you know, there's certain things that you'll never be able to completely prove and fairies sort of thrive and dwell in that trickery and in that corner of the eye. And that's what makes them so haunting, so entertaining and so kind of perpetually relevant. I love it. And, you know, one of the things that I know for sure is that each of us has our favorite. Uh, we may even have a least favorite. But one of the things I know about fairy tales, especially in, in the book that you've just written here, is that they are intriguing. When we come back, we're going to talk about what are some of these, which, which one, Varla, which is your favorite? And can I really say I'm not drunk? It's just my puka. I'll be right back. Want to help reduce the divisiveness in our world? Each year, the School for Esoteric Studies holds a subjective group conference. This year, our focus is on unity and diversity, the science of right human relations. From April till June, we will meditate together, study relevant writings, and share practical strategies for improving how we relate with each other. Join us to help build inclusive communities. Check on our subjective group conference at esotericstudies.net. That's the School for Esoteric Studies at esotericstudies.net. Stop. 
unstoppable. Who do executive women count on for up-to-date information on everything from stilettos to being heard in the boardroom? To achieve excellence, you must first take control of your life and develop a successful strategy with the unstoppable diva. Tune in to Up or Out with Connie Fife, Mondays 5 p.m. Eastern, as she cuts through the BS to guide you to become bold, connected, and unstoppable. For more information, visit uporout.com. Are you ready to start winning at the game of life? Lynn Brown, host of Get Into It, Winning at the Game of Life, is here to help you reach places and goals that you never thought possible. Lynn is an intuitive healer with a specialized background in financial healing. She combines her intuitive nature and her wholesome approach to financial planning. To learn more about her financial planning services, contact her personally at letter R, letter U, Intuit.com. You, yes you, can be the highest version of yourself. Wellness coach and natural beauty expert Dr. Agnes Renkel is on a mission to help you play the game of your life. Win in vibrancy, health, and beauty because you deserve it. Dr. Agnes goes beyond the limits in her personal coaching sessions to revolutionize health and wellness. Now is the time to unleash your true power. For more information, visit DrAgnesFrankel.com. Tune in to The Truth is Funny with Colette Steffen each Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This hit show will have you thinking outside the box and riding the wave of infinite potential. Join Colette on the Higher Self Network, inspiring listeners to shine their brilliance and ensure success while roaring with laughter as they recognize the humor of the giant cosmic joke. Visit TheTruthIsFunny.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Um, you know, Varla, before we jump ahead, we're actually going to give a couple of copies of the book away. Um, would you tell folks the best way to find out more about you and get a copy of the book from themselves? Oh, yeah. You can visit my website, which is varlaventura.net. And um, there's information about my books there, links, and also about a little contest that I'm running this month, it's a complete the fairy tale contest, and um, I've started a little intro paragraph, and then you just finish it in, in a relatively short fashion. All the details are on there, and I've already got some really amazing entries. So it's a it's a super fun way to kind of talk about fairies and fairy tales and get people's creativity flowing. And how did they find that? Tell me how they find that again, please. That's just cool. The- yeah, just go to varlaventura.net and it should be like a pinned post to the very top of the site. You'll be able awesome. to see the fairy tale contest information. I love it. I'm all over it. Um, okay, so for those of you out there, let's go ahead and give a copy of the book away. And if you're just tuning in, uh, the book is Fairies, Pukas, and Changelings, A Complete Guide to the to the wild and wicked en- enchanted realm. Okay, so I really um, before the break I was I was talking about I'm not drunk. It's just my puka tales <laughs> of a trickster fairy and its wild counterparts. I wish I would have had this growing up because some of the trouble I got in as a youngster, as a kid, a teenager, and in my twenties, I really do think it was somebody else. But let's talk about the stories for a minute. Do, do, how do you not have a favorite, or maybe you do? I I am rather fond of the puka. Um, <laughs> okay. The puka is a wonderful, uh, wonderful creature because the puka is a trickster. And I love to play jokes on people. And I love to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the phrase like get someone's goat. I think that actually comes from like the puka being either a rabbit, a goat, or a horse, and often taking like the form of a, of an animal. So I do like pukas. I find them to be, you know, they're, they're relatively harmless, although they can wreak some havoc. And they have this kind of wonderful ability to prey on someone that no one's going to believe anyway. And that kind of exacerbates the problem. So, you know, the person complaining that the puka took them on this wild midnight ride and that they really 
they were on their way home from the pub. They don't know wh- how so much time went by. How is it dawn already? And they would blame the puka. And another thing that I love about the puka is that I found in reading some of the accounts of puka encounters and legends of the puka that occasionally the puka, as I said, it most often appears as a rabbit or a horse. There are accounts of the puka actually being a, um, you know, a personless horse-drawn carriage, which immediately made me think of the headless horseman. And so I, my gears kind of started turning along those lines of how a story like that would evolve from these old legends. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I'll tell you, this is really, you know, for for people that are 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 tuning in. It's just one one of the many, many, many stories. But I love this idea. I love. I don't know what. I, I'm kind of thinking to myself, why do I like these tales of the trickster fairy? You know, what do you think Varla is going on with me around that? <laughs> we have a very good sense of humor. And I, you know, there's something about the idea that you can be tricked and you can be toyed with, but you actually aren't ultimately harmed. In fact, you're probably better for it. Maybe you finally give up the drink or maybe, you know, yeah. you stay closer to home on those like certain midnights or you know, maybe you even, like me, find yourself just a little bit hoping to have this puka encounter. I mean, I'm not saying I want to go missing for hours at a time at a night, but there's this part of me that's like, would it really, what would really happen if I were to take this other path home? And um, so I think there's a little bit of that and, and the idea that they're, you know, that they have a sense of humor. Honestly, like, I think Bugs Bunny has that. Bugs Bunny is an ultimate like trickster rabbit, right? So he kind of personifies in a in a well, I guess Bugs Bunny is probably not the most modern reference, but to me, you know, that's something of my childhood where you just laugh and laugh for hours at this rabbit always kind of out out foxing the you know tricking Elmer Fudd, and I think that that you know the idea mm-hmm. that rabbits are quick and and tricky, and that kind of goes right along with the idea of a rabbit as a puka. So now every time I see a bunny, of course, I'm just thinking like, there's a bunny in my backyard in the night. <laughs> no good. <laughs> it's not just eating my lettuce. It's up to no good. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, there. I was really, uh, um, you know, as I was reading the book, and by the way, let's give a copy of this away, 1-800-930-2819. I was really struck by not just the individual uh, tales in the book, but I, I was really most shocked, if I might say, when I got to the chapter um, uh, uh, that, that I think the question is, is that all there is? And I think I was caught by surprise because I thought, wow, I've never heard about this before. Fairies who give or the barter system. I was I just so wanted to ask you about how you uncovered that. Well, you know, I kind of started thinking about um sort of the moral of the story and how you have fairies that will sort of leave things behind. And I had been exploring the idea of the domestic fairies, the the brownies and the hobgoblins and the coblins who um you know, there are many different names for these kind of creatures that live domestically. They live within a household. They help keep things tidy. They look after crops. They look after, you know, your cow producing enough milk and all sorts of things like that. Mm -hmm. And in order to have those things, you must hold up your end of the bargain. And so I'm always, you know, I was kind of thinking like what stories sort of represent that, that bargain and, you know, Mm -hmm. what would you give up? And Rumpelstiltskin was an excellent example of that. And and I think we all can relate to that. You give me your firstborn child. That's a very common request yeah. in fairy kingdom. And, you know, we see this in everything from, you know, to get the Disney version of Sleeping Beauty to there's always everything comes at a price. And so the idea of fairies actually being very generous and very willing to give but one must hold up their end of the bargain or somehow um, out trick them, which all fairies are willing to give it up if they are convinced that you have 
met them uh, on the level that you're supposed to. So there's kind of this like ongoing lesson. I feel like the fairies are always teaching us lessons. They're tricking us. They're trying to um, convince us of things, but they also can be very giving and very um, generous in the, the, their supplies. You know, I, I, I want to stay with what you just mentioned, because, um, I, you know, it's one thing to just grow up and, you know, have these fairy tales. I didn't grow up with fairy tales. It wasn't part of, you know, my childhood. That came later on. I really did grow up with comic books and, and things like that, because, you know, as a young child, I moved around a lot from home to home as my mom was sick. But one of the things that I've come to really discover about myself is how gullible I am. And what I mean by that is when I read things in your book, right, as I believe many children do, we believe it. Is this because the stories, and they are, are so convincing what part of ourselves wants to believe and embrace, you know, the journey of the fairy, the puka, the goblin? What part of us is wanting to do that? Well, I think we have this need, whether we realize it or not. And, I, and I'll say as an aside, I mean, I consider myself a supernaturalist. I have a tendency mm -hmm. to believe. And so in that gullible, whatever you want to call it, in that same way, I will lean toward the side of it being more likely than unlikely. And that's, you know, that's not something I've always had. Of course, you have that more as a child. That's not something I've always had. It's something that the more I research and read about these things, the more I realize that, you know, maybe I'm just craving that, that to be real. Uh, but I do think that it's absolutely necessary for an individual and for some people more than others to be able to completely suspend belief or doubt. Because as soon as you are able to suspend doubt and open up your, your, the idea that this is possible, you also are able to suspend doubt in other aspects of your life and your personality. And so you can overcome some of those things of like, you know, well, I can never, I'll never be able to do that, or I'll never be good at that. And I feel like that, I mean, I know personally that that is a reason that I'm very drawn toward the idea of the fairy tale and that idea that of the whole sort of magical realm that this thing is existing with or without your belief, it's going on and it's doing its thing like the giant underground mushroom. It's there. And you can choose whether or not you want to tap into that knowledge or that experience. But I think there's something that we all crave and it's the reason we, you know, binge watch television shows or we get lost in, in fiction. We have to give ourselves the ability to believe in something that isn't real that isn't real as in right in front of yeah. us. And that really can help us. I mean, I think that's how we evolve, really. Yeah. And, you know, when we come back from break, we're going to talk about, you know, one of the stories or one of the characters that I read about in, in Varler's book that I had not heard of before. But as I was reading about it, all I kept saying was, yeah, that happened to me. Yeah, that happened to me. Yeah, I remember the time that this happened. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if I have one like in my life today that's like my very special personal, let's just call it, wicked enchanted friend. Stay tuned, everybody. We're going to take a short break. I'll be right back. Crowded hallways are the loneliest places. To see your life from an angel's perspective, book a personal consultation with Claire Candy Hoff, angelic walk in angel Ariel at Angel Healing House. Candy provides intuitive counseling, Reiki, and angel readings in person in Los Angeles or nationally and internationally via phone or Skype. 
she will channel the practical tools you need to transform your life. Call now, 831-277-3716 or visit angelhealinghouse.com. Do you feel that there's a bigger, better life for you? Is there anything holding you back from living the life you were meant to live? If you'd like to find your life's true purpose and calling, join the world's foremost authority on primal spirituality. David Carr share in Becoming a Sun Radio, emotional and spiritual intelligence for a happy, fulfilling life. Tune in once a month to Becoming a Sun Radio with David Carr share on the Dr. Pat Show and Transformation Talk Radio. For more information, visit davidcarshare.com today. On the cutting edge of the new mainstream, Christine Upchurch is passionate about bringing together science, psychology, and spirituality in a way that can be applied to our everyday lives for true transformation. The Christine Upchurch Show, stellar conversations to illuminate your journey, engages some of the most outstanding visionaries on the planet in lively dialogue to inspire you to become that bright light you're meant to be. Join Christine every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on KKNW, AM 1150, and Transformation Time. Radio. What if your body and mind were the compasses to the secrets, mysteries, and magic of life? Glenna Rice, co-host of The Questionable Parent, is inviting you to access all that is possible. Glenna is a 10-year certified veteran access consciousness facilitator who offers an amazing variety of life-changing classes and workshops. Work with Glenna from anywhere with teleclasses and workshops all over the globe. To learn more and see Glenna's current schedule of events, classes, and workshops, visit glennarice.com. Want to help reduce the divisiveness in our world? Each year, the School for Esoteric Studies holds a subjective group conference. This year, our focus is on unity in diversity, the science of right human relations. From April till June, we will meditate together, study relevant writings, and share practical strategies for improving how we relate with each other. Join us to help build inclusive communities. Check on our subjective group conference at esotericstudies.net. That's the school for esoteric studies at esotericstudies.net. Calling all moms, it's time to awaken your vibrant, intuitive, loving self in every area of your life. Join host Debbie Pokornik as she shares thoughts, stories, and tools to help you stand in your power. Listen to Vibrant Powerful Moms Helping Everyday Women Create Extraordinary Lives, Mondays at 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. For more information about Debbie, visit EmpoweringEnergy.com. That's Empowering with letters N-R-G.com. And you've been trying for so long to find out where your place is. But in their narrow minds, there's no room for anyone who dares to do something different. Wow. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, I want to make sure that all of you know we'd love to give a copy of the book away. Another copy, Fairies, Pukas, and Changelings. Uh, Varla Ventura joining me here today. This is a complete guide to the wild and wicked enchanted realm. Uh, Varla, one more time, if you don't mind telling folks, uh, first of all, uh, your website, but also tell them about uh, what you're doing with this little contest here. Yes. Okay. So my website is varlaventura.net. And through the month of April, the book just came out on April 1st. So from April 1st to the end of April, I'm accepting submissions. It's an end the fairy tale contest. So I've written an intro paragraph and I'm just asking people to submit their fairy tale ending to this story. And I'll be choosing uh, a couple of winners by the end of probably by mid May or so. And it includes, you know, notoriety and free books Sweet. and just fun. It's fun. Awesome. Uh, well, you know, before the break and during the break, I was saying I came across this one chapter in the book and I came across this this 
this character I had not heard of quite in this way called the brownie. And I was sharing with you that I was reading it and I was reading it and I was saying, wait a minute, that happened to me. No, that happened to me. Oh yeah, one night I actually woke up and I was black and blue all over my arm. Tell us about the brownie. What an interesting character. So the brownie is is one name for um, a rather adored fairy in the fairy kingdom, in spite of the the, the black and blue, <laughs> the black and blue pinching. Um, the brownie is one of the most uh, accepted and domestic fairies. The brownie lives with people in their homes or on their land, and will do wonderful things for you. Maybe the brownie will clean your house, or maybe the brownie will make sure that your crops are protected and your your cows are, are well looked after. There's even one account of a very faithful brownie who is very attached to a family, and their cow is not producing milk, and so he ran all over the countryside, stealing little bits of milk from all the other cows so that the family had enough milk. And all the brownie really asks for in payment is, you know, well, one, you, you've got to kind of hold up your end of the bargain. So you have to do your own hard work. Brownies don't like people who are lazy. And they also expect payment in the form usually of food and drink like wine and cake. And you can't leave them leftover scraps. You, ha you can't just say, oh, I'll just put something off my plate I didn't eat for the brownie. They won't have. <laughs> It has to be something, you know, wonderful, and you have to make kind of a, a peace with them. And what's very interesting about the brownies is that you, and they, they also live a lot in, in farms and, and have an affinity for animals and get along well with animals. And they're not too, um, they're not too mischievous. However, they will do little sort of impish things. So the imp is maybe the more... Um, uh, nasty counterpart to something like a brownie and imp okay. some of the, you know, more, more mischievous tricks and things, but sometimes the brownies take things they can, you know, you can hold them accountable for missing items that you're sure where they were. And I think I, I love the idea. I mean, how many of us can wake up in the morning and swear that our house is exactly the way we left it. Do you, are you really sure that that box was where you put it? Are you really sure you left that on the counter? I mean, most of us are just living our lives and our, we kind of take for granted where we keep our stuff until it's, until it's missing. So the brownie is both uh, wonderful and a little bit, um, not, not feared, but you do sort of have to, you have to coexist in, in the right way with the brownie. And there are a lot of uh, counterparts to the brownie. I think there's a, an equivalent in Italy that um, in Italian culture, they, the names escaped me, but they, they basically, you have, to, it's for children's rooms. And this could be one of those wonderful threats of Italian mothers, like, you know, clean your room or the, you know, the such and such is going to come after you, but they will help children clean their rooms as long as the children are, you know, they take their baths when they're supposed to, and they listen to their mother, the, this creature will actually come in and like tidy up for them while they're out playing. So there's a lot of different examples of these kind of wonderful domestic fairies. Yeah. And, you know, here's what I love about this. Um, have you ever, have you ever gotten up and start scratching your head? And you're scratching your head because you're looking around and you're saying, now, wait a minute. Linda and I do this all the time. And later, we're scratching our head and later we're turning around and we're saying, now, look, I know I put that right there. I know I put it there. I know my keys were there. I know. I, I, and you, you swear that that's what, ha what happened. Uh, but after a while, you kind of think, well, wait a minute. They're not there now. Where did they go? How often have we done that? And how often have we not looked at fairies, pookers, and changelings? Right. <laughs> they're to blame. I'm telling you, they're to blame. I'll probably wake up pinched black and blue just for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what are you, for you today? Because I know that you are so immersed in this world. For you today, is there any one enchanted creature that you are most intrigued with? 
Well, I certainly am, you know, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm quite, I'm quite interested in the puka, but I do like the idea of the sort of household helpers. Those are always really interesting. I find dwarves to be sort of underrated. Dwarves and trolls are underrated and somewhat elusive. Um, the dwarf is actually can, can kind of be connected to something like a, uh, a goblin or the, the word goblin is actually from a Welsh word, which is coblin, which also alludes to a cobbler or a, um, you know, a shoemaker. Now I didn't know this until I really st del started, you know, diving into the the deeper folklore. But leprechauns are actually known as the cobbler of the fairy world. So there's some references to something like a coblin, which is actually more leprechaun-like, or what we would call a leprechaun. And they tap 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 on their on their their little shoe bench. And this tap, tap, tapping is how you actually can find them <sighs> if you're looking for them and you're trying to get that pot of gold. And, um, you know, then I started, uh, then once I heard about the tapping, that made me think of the Tommy knockers, which we've heard of. And that's a very common thing that Cornish miners and other miners, um, but they came over from Cornwall, the idea that there are helpful spirits in the mines that help you find gold or kind of lure you to or away from potential um, cave-ins. And then, you know, then we have the dwarf association with mines and being in the underground. And in some ways they are, you know, I don't, I don't consider them the same creature, but it is a different name for a regional um, being that has very similar characteristics. So I feel like, you know, Dwarves are kind of underrated. We don't we don't really fear them or know about them as we um, as we do with some of the other. Right. Uh, I don't think I could pick just one. I mean, who would I want to encounter on a you know midnight romp? Yeah, yeah. That's that's a tough one. Probably, yeah. probably you know maybe a maybe a puka, but I I might just like to talk with a with an imp and get some tips. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, what I love about it is that you are inviting us into into a world of imagination that is relatable. And that's what I love about this is it's coming up with, yeah, we are talking about we are talking about the fairy kingdom, but everyone pretty much can look at their own lives right now and and relate to it um and that's really what's kind of cool we're going to take a short break we come back how how do we enter the fairy kingdom or maybe more importantly how not to stay tuned we'll be right back Tune in to the Psychic Professors Show, The Voices of Spirit Radio, with international medium and spirit artist Dr. Susan Barnes on Transformation Talk Radio, featuring a variety of spiritual topics such as psychic art, spiritualism, EVP, psychic development, and mediumship. This hit call-in show provides listeners with breakthrough wisdom to enliven and enlighten their lives. Visit spiritartgallery.net for show days and times. Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet. Welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. Thrive is what we experience when our mind, body, and soul operate as one. When we thrive, we excel on all levels. Thrive is the mindset that matters. It is essential to our being. Have you ever found yourself looking for the instruction manual on how to thrive? You'll find everything you need to help you feel strong, powerful, and peaceful in your own body. So don't waste any more time. Visit thrivebygen.com today. TheAngelLady.net 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 
true story. The Angel Lady. The Angel Lady. The Angel Lady. Net. 1-800-323-1790. Sue Storm. Sue Storm. The Angel Lady. Brand consultant Jen Morgan is here with Radically Distinct Radio to help you take control of your future and maximize your brand's power to produce results. Whether you're an individual trying to reinvent yourself and launch a new venture, or you're an executive trying to reposition your company to modernize your sales and marketing programs, Jen Morgan and the RAD Method empower you to play to your strengths and show up in the world as your most powerful brand. To learn more, go to jenmorgan.com, that's Jen with two N's, morgan.com, or call 206 9 Tune in to Mainstream Metaphysics Radio to harness your connection with the universe to effect change for optimal success and happiness. Name one of the country's top psychics. Eve now brings her insights and gifts to this weekly hit call-in show. Joined by visionaries, leaders, and gifted others, but mostly you. Jot it down. Thursdays, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Whether you're plugged into Netflix, watching The Travelers or Stranger Things or even the OA, one of the things that both uh, um, Varla and I were talking about is how now we have a different version of what this book is about. And she and I were talking about, you know, there's, it's almost like there's a more, you know, more intelligent version of what we grew up with. Yet at the same time, it's all highly intriguing. And what, what I think Verla, I'm finding is, regardless of how old you are, it used to be, right, that the people in marketing would say, oh, we got to market to this age. We got to market to this age. But my gosh, a movie comes out and it's not the kids that are going, it's the parents that are going, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we were kind of talking a little off break there about mm-hmm. What I, what I refer to as the Harry Potter phenomenon. And it's not that, it's not that we didn't have examples of sort of, you know, magical books and worlds. You know, we had Lord of the Rings and we had things like that. But what that did is it, it opened this gateway for people to sort of read and appreciate and sort of be part of that magical world that we're all so desperately craving. It was like, we're in a world of reality TV then, like the worst reality TV. (laughs) So it was this wonderful, like other side. And I think that apart from the fact that there are beautifully written books and created this whole other realm, but we, as a, as a culture, we're craving that. And it's, yeah, it was the adults who were reading it just as much as, as the kids. And I think that that has kind of, you know, that kind of, reintroduced a certain amount of uh, magic into our, you know, certainly into our consuming of, of books and movies and television shows. And now we have things that are, and I mean, it's all, it's, there's cycles to all these kinds of things, but I think now uh, we have a more natural acceptance of sort of these magical things. It's not a Oh, that's a imaginary thing that's on the other side of the fence. There's right. playing with the idea that it, that is the thing that's tapping. It's not a branch tapping on your window. It's not, you know, what are you, um, you know, is it something in your head or is that, you know, what the trickster wants you to think it is so that they get away with it? So, that, you know, it kind of plays into that idea. And, you know, I think we we definitely need if for no other reason, we need to escape the, um, you know, some of the sad truth of our (laughs) daily reality. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I, I, I said before the break was that, okay, enter the kingdom, right? And you talk about this, you say, you say, whoops, there it is, how to enter the fairy kingdom, and then parentheses, or how not to. And I think that at many, many levels, that's really what we're talking about. You know, 
some of us really wanted to live in the fairy kingdom quite a bit because our lives and the reality, at least in the neighborhood I grew up in, you know, it was way better to uh, hang out in Neverland, right? Right. Um, but I would love for you to share what this part of the book, you know, is really talking about for folks. Well, it's interesting because it's actually toward the end of the book. But in, in my mind, the book actually started this way because as a child, a very young child, I was warned on more than one occasion on a, probably a regular basis. Once we, we lived in a uh, we lived in a city and we moved into the forest very remote, no electricity, no running water. I mean, we moved to a very remote area. Um, it's less remote now, but then my parents still don't have running or they have mm-hmm. running. They still don't have electricity. They're not, they're still off. They're off. They were off grid before it was yeah. be off grid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they were off grid out of necessity. Uh, in any case, I was, have been warned on more than one occasion to avoid fairy mounds and fairy mounds are, you know, usually a circle of mushrooms. It can be a circle of rocks. And my mom would just say, you know, that's a delicate place and that's the place for the fairies. And we had a sort of a reverence and appreciation for them. But you weren't to, it was instilled in me at a young age that you were not to mess with them, that you should never fall asleep on the fairy mound because the fairies very much want to take you into their world. However, once you're there, it's nearly impossible to get back. And I think we had this with, you know, Brian Froud had that wonderful book that he published in the in the 70s of like these amazing illustrations of all these old creatures still published to this day and just absolutely beautiful illustrations and definitely talks about this sort of darker side of, you know, it's this lovely enchanted place. But, you know, and as a child, you're growing up and you're hearing like, oh, you know, there's this this version of the fairy tale and the mermaid, you know, just gets to like be with her prince. But actually the mermaid <laughs> feet are, you know, she's in a tremendous pain and she has to make this tremendous sacrifice. And, you know, maybe it turned out okay in the end, but this girl was frozen on a loaf of bread and sunk in a bog for the majority of her life. And so there's, you know, there's these kind of things that we, I I was sort of raised with a a healthy dose of fear. And so there are a couple of things that you um, should never do if you find yourself somehow among the fairy. And um, you should never eat or drink anything they offer you. And let me tell you, they're going to offer you the best of the best. You're going to have, you know, a feast with an amazing goblet full of the most (laughs) amazing smelling anything you could ever imagine. Or, you know, a saucer full of the most beautiful fresh cream with strawberry. I mean, they're going to lay it out. (laughs) You do that you become kind of uh, uh, enslaved in their world. And in some cases, who minds, right? That's great. Yeah, I'd rather live with the fairies. But in other cases, it's as so often, it's not all it's uh, really cut out to be. And soon the enchantments fall. Um, And there's a wonderful connection with people who are seers, or as they say in Ireland, that have the sight or the second sight, and that they are people who did actually uh, enter the fairy realm and did not uh, succumb, but they are able to see fairies. And there's a a couple of stories I've included in the book of people, um, you know, and that's in this last chapter about how not to get there, where you can actually pick out a fairy nurse or a fairy woman in, in a busy marketplace because you have this sight and that's one way that you can get it or that it can be passed down generations, but you got it originally because your great, great grandmother struck a bargain Mm -hmm. got out of the fairy realm and came out of the, the fairy mound. Uh, (laughs) Oh man. Well, you know, I mean, this is, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for today. I mean, I cannot believe this hour just zipped by. Uh, Please give out your website again. And one last thing, how can people, um, how how can people, people buy the book? And what's your personal message? What would you like to leave us with? Well, I want to just say that I've enjoyed this conversation tremendously. And I feel like you and I should sit down and have tea (laughs) and and speak of very things. 
Uh, you can visit my website. It's varlaventura.net, and you will find details of the contest. You'll find current information, future interviews I'm doing, links to the archive of this show, of course, and many other wonderful uh, enchantments, including links to how to buy all my books. They're in print. They're available anywhere books are sold, so you can get them online. You can get them through Amazon or Indigo, mm-hmm. whatever uh, outlet you choose. Um and I think I just want to thank you again for having yeah, me. Just let bet. people know that uh, it is okay to believe and it is okay to think of this other world as um, something that's actually coexisting with us and that we have spent mm-hmm. a lot of time trying to evolve away as a, as uh, you know, culturally, we've tried to evolve away from some of these enchantments. Mm-hmm. But if you look back to some of the original stories and some of the indigenous um, beliefs and 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 practices and ways of living with plants and and animals mm-hmm. and in cultures, you'll I find know. that you're really really better off just believing it to begin with. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, just believe. All right, everybody, we're gonna take a short break. More on transformation talk radio coming up right now. The preceding audio was via a Skype call.